welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 87. I'm Steve Kwan. I'm Matt Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. Rolling on, talking about open guard again. This is the third of five episodes that we want to do. And today, we're going to talk about butterfly guard. Yup, great position. Probably probably the most common guard that I use, butterfly guard, is uh, is really awesome. The main things that characterize butterfly guard are inside position with the legs, hooks, and some form of upper body control, whether it's grabbing the head, grabbing the body, grabbing the arm, you know, double unders, any of these variations. So those are kind of the, the main features of butterfly guard. And the great thing about it is it is a dynamic guard from the open guard position where you are elevating and off balancing. You're not tethering yourself like a closed guard. So lots of great entries into leg locks and sweep opportunities. Yeah, when I think of butterfly guard, I kind of think of it as the inside channel guard. Because when you're doing butterfly guard, everything you're doing, you're going for the inside position. You're trying to get your legs on the inside. You're trying to get your arms on the inside. You're trying to get your head on the inside. Basically, you're trying to get every limb in your body and your head inside that safe zone in front of your opponent where they can't really grab you or do anything to you. And then from there, you have opportunities to load them up on top of you and sweep them or pull them and elevate and go for things like leg attacks. Yeah. And butterfly guard has a few different mechanisms that we talk about Uh, it is a hook based guard but depending on how you control the upper body you might like I mentioned you might be controlling a torso like you know joining your hands or cupping their traps with underhooks Uh, you might control an arm such as an arm drag or even elevating off the two-on-one or you might even control their head in like a collar tie fashion or it could be a combination of any of those things I just mentioned Uh, the hooks elevate and your knees are always in front of your opponent dominating the inside space acting as frames so you got your you got your shins that prevent your opponent from coming closer and you got your hooks used to elevate so it's really diverse and um in the the highest levels of jiu-jitsu nowadays you see butterfly guard as a very common guard and i think even in you know it might be even said that in no gi you see it a lot more than uh, in the gi just because in the gi there's many guards where you close your legs around your partner i find are more common whereas in no gi a lot of times especially going against good leg lockers it's a, it's a smart choice to hunt the inside position and from there you have a lot of dynamic guard play it's definitely a great way to get at your opponent's legs but even in the gi When I'm fighting guys who want to do butterfly sweeps, I find it really annoying to have to fight someone who's doing butterfly guard because in the gi, they can grab your belt, they can grab the fabric on your lapels, and it makes it hard for you to escape and back out. That's one of the things about butterfly guard in no gi is if you don't want to be there, you can back out. But in the gi, once the person starts attacking the sweep, because they can grab cloth, it makes it actually really hard to escape. Yeah, it does. And butterfly guard is one of those positions where, you know, if you're flat on your back in the butterfly guard, you're not really playing butterfly guard. You're actually just getting fucked up. It's not a good position to be in when you're flat on your back. You want to be sitting up with good posture, actually leaning forward so that you can't be put back down to the floor. And uh, from there, looking to pull your opponent on top of you and getting underneath. So I first started learning butterfly guard Again, studying the book X Guard and Butterfly Guard by Marcelo Garcia, who is probably, I mean, really, he's probably the godfather of the Butterfly Guard if there ever was such a distinction, just because he made it so popular and so commonplace in the early 2000s when he was tearing it up in ADCC and IBJJF and, uh, you know, using X Guard and just sweeping everyone with it. Such a strong position. And, you know, you watch the guys like the Danaher Death Squad, specifically like Gordon Ryan, used used to be Eddie Cummings, you know, who's pretty much specifically a butterfly guard player or a sit-up guard player. These guys are really sharp using it to get into like uh, Kani Basamis and different leg entanglements. Of course, easy to get into single leg X. So it really is a system that joins many techniques, many guards together and you can use it for a lot of variety of different attacks as well you know of course like there's not just leg locks you know you can see gordon he hit that really famous shoulder crunch on buchesha now everyone is talking about that sweep just because that basically won him the match gordon's got one of the best open guards out there for sure so that's pretty awesome 
Butterfly Guard takes a little bit of getting used to initially because you don't really have a lot of control over your opponent. You're in front of them, but they can still move around. They don't have to sit there while you're playing Butterfly Guard. And that's one of the things that you need to keep in mind when you're playing that guard. It is a very reactive guard. There's a time and a place for it. And if your opponent is not giving you the right energy to play Butterfly Guard, sometimes it can be a little bit challenging to do. But as you mentioned, Butterfly Guard is incredibly effective as an entry towards techniques that attack the legs. Last episode, we talked about X Guard and single leg X Guard, and these are great examples of that. Butterfly Guard is an awesome entry if you want to get into that guard because you can use Butterfly Guard to elevate your opponent and get underneath them. And that's one of the reasons why Butterfly Guard is so fantastic if you want to play the type of game that attacks the lower body. It's also great for smaller guys because, first of all, if you're smaller, it's not a bad idea to go to butterfly guard because you can do a lot from there it's a great position to get underneath your opponents or to get behind them and those kinds of strategies tend to work very well if you're a smaller person i like butterfly guard quite a bit i personally don't ever really use that old school butterfly sweep you know the one where you grab your opponent's arm and you try to tip them over i've always found that to be quite challenging to do just the hook sweep yeah yeah that said to use that as a strategy to get under your opponent i think that's actually where it's most powerful yeah i i actually try and use that hook sweep quite a bit and the thing about it is i think the the hook sweep in its purity, like the main hook sweep that you can do, it's against a really good opponent, probably going to be pretty difficult to get. But understanding, you know, the reactions you're going to get from your opponent and also, you know, their defenses, usually for me, it leads to some variation of the hook sweep. So it's not going to be like that first standard hook sweep, but there are so many ways to deal with your opponent basing out it's it's super applicable for the gi as well you know from from just a sweeping point of view or you know maybe not even using it for leg locks but to just improve your position in the gi man it's awesome especially when you can get like sleeves and collars and things like that yeah like i really use it a lot and and we should also mention you know uh, i'm studying open guard from the seated position from gordon ryan right now and he's he's mentioning how you know like he breaks down his open guard seated into four scenarios. So standing with your feet uh, staggered, standing with your feet in a linear line, kneeling with one knee up, and then being on both knees. So uh, butterfly guards applicable for the last two that I mentioned, either your opponents on their knees or their uh, one knee up. And uh, yeah, it's it's just like the thing I think about when I'm when I'm studying Gordon stuff, he's always saying just dominate the inside space, you know, and that's why he's so difficult to pass is because he's always managing his knees and his elbows to the inside position and just making it impossible for his opponent to penetrate those frames and pummel like a body lock style pass or something like that. Like I, I've been training with Stuart Cooper lately, who's a legendary BJJ video maker. He now lives in Vancouver teaches at Diaz Combat Sports downtown and one of his favorite go-to passes is the body lock pass. If I'm not careful when I train with him, he can totally get underhooks on me from the seated position and then flatten me out. And I know he, uh, I think he credits uh, Lachlan Giles because he trained with him and Lachlan is very good at using the body lock pass. So I'm starting, to, I'm trying to use it more. I do find issues using it against bigger guys, but it is a super powerful pass, especially against the butterfly guard. And it really is a, a fantastic way to just smash your opponent out. But again, back to my point, dominating the inside space with knees and elbows is kind of the main goal and if you you know if you lose a frame or whatever you have to just like any guard you have to manage the distance and pummel back to the inside position one of the things about butterfly guard that takes some getting used to is that it feels really vulnerable because you're sitting down in front of your opponent and you're not really latching on to them and holding them where they are It takes a while to get used to attacking from that position because your opponent can move around and your job is to respond to that movement. One of the things that makes Butterfly Guard really powerful is you get in close enough and with the inside channel, both with your legs, with your arms, with your head, you're in so close that it's very hard for your opponent to attack you from there. And it feels kind of counterintuitive because you're right in front of your opponent and it feels like they should be able to do bad things to you but if you're in that close it's actually hard for them to do it 
Yeah, especially if you get in like ch- into a chest to chest situation with your head being the guard player, your head underneath your opponent's head. That is a good example of head position when you're playing butterfly guard, because essentially you prevent your opponent from uh, getting their head underneath your head and you prevent them from smashing you into body lock passes and situations like that. There, there are so many great techniques from the butterfly guard. Like I, I actually really like the hook sweep. I use it a lot. Uh, if the hook sweep doesn't work and they base out a lot of the time that creates entries into the legs and other other hook sweep variations um and of course things like uh non-committal attacks from that position like arm drags are super useful like i i basically look for the arm drag every time i roll i mean it's it's one of the most fundamental moves you know if your opponent is basing out on their hands or if they're trying to control your feet and they're fixing their hands in a certain position then you can quickly get an arm drag and i mean it's it's the beginner killer you know it's like (laughs) any beginner you go to they're going to be susceptible to arm drags because they have no idea how to keep their elbows close to their body so it's so easy to reverse positions from the bottom there against against bigger guys you you find that guys tend to posture up a lot more and keep their elbows close to their body so you have to be a little bit more tricky when it comes to that but that's definitely one of my favorite techniques from there That's a really good point, which is that you don't need to go to butterfly guard and attack a predictable sweep that your opponent might be expecting. You can open up with Kazushi attacks like arm drags, for example. Or another thing you can do is you can push the guy's head. If you're the guy on the bottom and you're playing butterfly guard, if you angle yourself to the side, you can actually use your hand as a frame to push their head away and try to create awkward angles for them. And a lot of the time, that's a good strategy to use if you're playing butterfly rather Other than just going for something that your opponent might be expecting right away, I find when I'm playing Butterfly, one of the things I like to do is I will use my palm to push my opponent's face and keep it away and try to get him to turn away and sideways from me. Because if I do that, I can open up a lot of awkward angles that I can exploit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and grabbing the head is basically my go to when I can't. Uh, you know, if, if they're on their knees, I can't easily grab their legs. Uh, it's, it's different if they post one knee up, then it's quite easy to grab the leg. Or if they are standing, obviously, you can grab the leg. But if they're on two knees, then there's not really an opportunity to grab their legs. So what are you left with, right? You can either tether yourself to their torso, which can be difficult because you got to get past the arms. You can isolate a single arm in an arm drag or a two on one, or you can grab the head and the head is pretty hard for them to to hide you know especially if they're on their knees unless this person is an absolute tower uh you're going to be able to grab their head and just by grabbing their head you know what that does is break their posture it takes them out of alignment and basically in that moment when you're snapping them down is your moment to create an offense or as gordon says get into an offensive cycle so that's kind of the goal from there um they won't be able to get offensive usually until they get their posture back, right? So what do they have to do? They have to hand fight with you and prevent you from collar tying them. So snap downs, you know, snap downs and doing technical stands into front headlock positions, or even if you can just rush them and get height advantage, like we've talked about in previous episodes, uh, that's kind of a great way to create movement against someone who's just like, they're just, they're basically not giving you anything. You know, you always roll, you ever roll those guys and when you're playing butterfly guard, they're like on both knees and they just, they're basically trying to stall you out keep their arms in tight well that's a good opportunity if they do that if you can't access the arms as levers to uh, access the head as a lever that's actually likely the highest percentage attack i have from butterfly guard which is my opponent kneels down on both knees and you just can't move them and if you detect that they're doing that that makes for a really stable base for them that makes it hard to sweep them but if your opponent is on both knees it's hard for them to level change so what i do is if my opponent is on both knees i'll frame against their face so i'll use my hand to force them at an awkward angle and then i'll do a technical stand up and just bum rush them and because i can get up to my feet really quick and i've pushed them away and they're still on their knees, usually that forces them backwards into the guard, which means that I've basically gotten two points without having to actually lift up and manipulate their weight. This is something that Oliver Taza uh, taught us when he came out for one of his seminars. It's a really great concept from the butterfly guard when your opponent is is just stifling you and I mean, essentially stalling. And, and this does happen at the higher levels, you know. 
there's usually more of a feeling out process. There's less mistakes that are made because the competitors are more disciplined. But at the lower levels, you know, it's amazing how sloppy guys are when they approach the butterfly guard. You know, if they if they give you their weight at all or they extend their arms at all, then there's really good opportunities to sweep, to drag, to elevate all types of stuff, you know? And then from there, just there's tons of, there's tons of situations. So, I mean, Gordon, you know, his, his main uh, goals from the open guard anyways, are isolate a single limb, expose the center line or start going towards the back. Right. So, I mean, drags, obviously, isolate a limb but they also give you back exposure uh you could also try and come up and get height advantage which we discussed and then think about think about your opponent engaging you while you have butterfly guard you know and they're on their knees they're not giving you anything so if you pop up to your knees real quick and you start pushing into them so they're falling backwards now and you get your head higher than their head you're putting them in a dilemma where they basically have to react you know the only thing they can't do is nothing because if they do nothing then they get swept right? So if they constantly are moving back, you can just keep pressuring them and driving them forward. And if they drive back into you, you can a lot of the time use that momentum to create sumigayashi, or even you could snap them down and start attacking the front headlock, which again exposes their back. Like it's just a, you're not really doing a move, you know, you're just sort of using a strategy and a concept to create a reaction, which I, the more I do jujitsu, the more I realize that at the highest levels, it's hard to do moves. You know, it's it's easier to create reactions and create vulnerability that way rather than like actually trying to go for a move. Every move at the higher levels takes so much setup and so much, so much reactions. Yeah, that's a really, really important point, which is that with butterfly guard, especially, you're not likely to see a lot of textbook moves getting done where you just go for this sweep and you hit it exactly. You're so reactive to your opponent's movement and it's so important to create openings on your opponent so normally it's just a series of little things that eventually create an opening that you can exploit and sometimes the thing you do that works winds up being super ugly the example i gave earlier being that you just do a technical stand up from butterfly if the guy's just kneeling there on both knees that is a very effective way to sweep from butterfly and a lot of people would probably not even consider that to be a sweep but you've got to take what you can get and a big part of butterfly guard is finding and creating those openings it's a guard where one of the things your opponent can do which is really annoying is they can just frustrate you and make it hard for you to move them and especially against larger opponents this can happen a lot and rather than trying to force a move that isn't there if your opponent is down on both knees and they're just making themselves really sturdy sometimes the best thing to do is to try to isolate a single lever and use that for kazushi or if you you realize that your opponent is sitting there on both knees and they're just like a mountain, then just get up because then they're in this awkward position where you're up on your feet and they're still on their knees. That's an excellent strategy for a smaller person. And one of the things that is nice about butterfly guard is you can do that. You know, if you're playing closed guard and your opponent is just making a boulder out of themselves and you can't move them, it's kind of hard to just stand up because your legs are wrapped around them. You got to be careful playing that strategy from closed guard because they might grab your leg if you try it. But from butterfly guard, it's pretty easy if your opponent is just basing on both knees to just get up and then just run them over. Yeah, and the great thing about that is under no jujitsu competition rules that I'm aware of, you know, if you're if you're in butterfly guard, y- you can just basically come up onto your knees, onto your, you know, into a combat base with no penalty if your op- if your opponent grabs your legs and puts you back down to the mat. So, you know, if, if you are in butterfly guard and you come up and then your opponent gr- tackles you back down, there's no penalty. All that's done is create a reaction where now you might be able to hit hook sweeps to the back and pull them on top of you. Of course, there's if you if you come up with one leg in the middle from the butterfly guard and then your opponent drives you back down, you also have like Kani Basami there if you roll through. You know, a good example of that is Gary Tonin versus Gilbert Burns at Polaris. That's a really great, I believe it was Polaris. That's a good example of how, you know, coming up and then rolling underneath into a 411 ends in a leg lock, right? So these are great entries. Uh, simply just by starting by pressuring your opponent from the bottom and coming up into a heist where you basically, you know, you force your opponent to react. Either they have to retreat, in which case you can now 
push the tempo and get on top a lot of the time, or they're going to try and tackle you back down to the floor. In which case, again, Sumi Gaeshi, Kani Basami, and no penalties at all. There's no, they don't score. It's not a takedown or anything like that. So it's actually a really safe strategy. It's, it, you feel vulnerable the first few times you do it, but it is super effective and super safe and good for basically any rule set that I'm aware of, whether it's ADCC or IBJJF. One of my favorite butterfly guard positions is actually the half butterfly guard, which is pretty much as you could imagine it. You know, you have your bottom leg hooking like a half guard, but instead of clamping with your top leg coming across the the hips and locking your feet, you pummel the top foot inside. So not only do you have like, you know, you don't have a closed circuit per se, but you do have like a, a, a clamp with your half guard and you also have a hook. So it allows you to kind of lock your opponent in place, but you can also elevate your opponent. You can also do canny basamis underneath, you know, elevate, get into a variety of different guards if you do break their balance. It, it Half butterfly is a fantastic position. I remember when I went and I fought the Vegas Open last year and I did three tournaments in a row. And on the Nogi day, I went against an Otto's black belt who's, who's actually seemed quite a bit bigger than me in the first match. And I remember pl- getting to my butterfly half and, he, you know, he's basically just playing like a pretty bread and butter style of smashing. And against the butterfly half, there's it's really hard hard to smash through that because your frames are so well aligned tried to elevate him couldn't elevate him and then at one point in the match I took my leg out I remember switching to like a a, a, like a standard half guard like a knee shield and right away I felt him like pour the pressure on because I guess he was like waiting for me to take my foot out of the inside position and I immediately felt my hips starting to become collapsed so (laughs) I reset and I was like fuck this I'm going back to (laughs) butterfly half guard and then I elevated him and arm barred him so it's like you know it's it's a having your feet on the inside makes it just makes things so much safer I feel and it just it creates so much kazushi whereas strong half guards where your legs are clamped around the outside For me personally, I feel like I don't have the same angle with my top frame. So I I usually in competition will try and use like a butterfly half guard. I just feel safer using it. The other nice thing about that butterfly half guard is you can use that to try to pry one of your opponent's legs free. If your game requires you isolating a leg so you can go into a leg lock series or so you can go to an X guard or go for some sort of like leg drag sweep from the bottom. If you want to get his leg free, it can be hard to do that from butterfly guard. But if you go to that butterfly half guard, you can use your foot to start to pry that leg loose and then eventually try to get your hands on it. Yeah. And I would recommend, I always tell my guys, if you want to see good examples of butterfly half guard, my first recommendation is usually Eddie Cummings. You know, he doesn't compete anymore, which is a shame. And I don't even know if he's training as much as he did before, but he had some of the best butterfly half guard there was and he also you know this is maybe like four or five years ago when he was really full-on competing he was coming up in a time when leg locks were still very like new and not basically if you watch his highlights you know at the lower levels nobody knew what he was doing nobody knew how to stop these attacks and he basically goes from butterfly half into into 411 you know by elevation in like every single fight and from there gets a heel hook and then i obviously gordon ryan has a great butterfly half guard but you do still see i don't want to say traditional because i don't know if that's the word i would use to describe it but like craig jones still plays a traditional style half where his top leg is on the outside uh, it is kind of like a Z guard. It's a little bit different. He does entries from the bottom that are just like I have like I know how he does it, but I just can't make it work for my body type. And of course, you know, you watch a guy like Kyle Terra. He plays usually a standard half guard with his legs not in the inside. Well, one of the legs is on the inside position. The other one's usually just clamped on top in like a hip clamp, just a standard half guard. So Still very effective, but for me, man, I I find such a difference playing butterfly, at least butterfly half. If I do get knocked to my back, that is basically my standard go-to position that I try and work from. 
Yeah, the big thing with regular half guard is you're so vulnerable to getting smashed and flattened out. And as I progress more and more, my focus now is on not leaving openings for that kind of stuff. Because if you get smashed and flattened out on your back, it's going to be a bad scene. So for that reason, regular half guard, I mean, if I'm forced into that position, I'll play it. But it's not my first choice because it is pretty easy for your opponent to put your shoulders to the mat. One of the things about butterfly guard that's actually really awesome is it is a very powerful defensive position and that's counterintuitive because you look at it and it doesn't look like it would be i remember seeing butterfly guard and thinking originally man this position doesn't look like you're very safe there because you don't have really a lot of control over your opponent you're not clamping onto them and hindering their movements and i realize now that there's more to keeping yourself safe than being being able to hold your opponent down in terms of types of guard the way that we would classify this butterfly guard is a hook guard you're not really clamping onto the person so you're not really acting like a tether that is preventing their movement but Preventing someone's movement is not the only way that you can defend yourself. The thing about butterfly guard is because you're keeping small, it makes it really hard for your opponent to isolate one of your levers or to separate your elbows from your knees, which of course is what you do if they want to pass the guard, right? The thing about butterfly guard is if the person on top tries to rush you and they get to your side, well, they still haven't passed. In order to pass, they've got to create space between your elbows and your knees knees and then put a wedge there to hold you so that you can't get that space closed again. If you're in butterfly guard and you just keep tight the whole time, then you can roll around and get back into a good position again. So it's kind of counterintuitive because it doesn't feel like it should be a strong defensive position, but it's deceptive in that fashion. Yeah, I I like how butterfly is like, you know, your hands and your feet are protected just by just by the nature of you having the inside position and also it's very easy for you to hand fight from there you can do a lot of effective hand fighting and dragging and all types of stuff from there quite safely it's it's a position where there's like many layers so if you get knocked to your back you still have half butterfly or half guard or You know, if you have to resort to like a single leg X or an X or even a deep half, like all these guards are still kind of behind you as lines of defense. So, you know, it's it's very much like a front line open guard where uh, there's many, many ranges still available for you to utilize. And uh, yeah, you know, it's it's one of those guards that I mean, truthfully, it kind of relies on your opponent to give you forward pressure if you're looking to sweep and get underneath. And the truth is against good guys, you know, it's pretty easy to not give that forward pressure. And that that does kill a lot of the butterfly guard. But then again, you're you're kind of stalling from the top if you're not given pressure. So, again, like a great strategy from the bottom, not only just to elevate your opponent over top of you, but to push them backward, because that, again, it solicits a response from them to now push back and a lot of the time when this happens their weight comes forward and you're able to elevate them or at least cause them to extend their limbs and post out on the mat and that is like if you can do that that's basically where you're going to get all your leg lock entries that's where you're going to going to get all your sweeps and, and submission opportunities as well it's also a great way to set up a headlock series if you want to do a snap down or set up a front choke and you can't get your opponent's head down low enough if you push their head away when they bring their head back that's when you set up that opportunity i used to have a hard time getting head attacks from butterfly guard because i just didn't think it was realistic that i could grab my opponent's head and pull it down especially if i'm much smaller but what i find is if i push their head away and use that opportunity to get up to my feet when they bring their head back then they're in prime position for a headlock that's basically off the snap down heist series but we have we've talked about arm drags but one thing we haven't talked about is how effective collar drags are from there uh of course like cross collar grip is kind of it's probably one of my go-tos from like the seated guard if i'm playing gi if not to sweep from but as a way to set up other guards like collar sleeve and things like collar ankle if they stand up The collar drag, just like the arm drag, is super effective as a takedown and a sweep. I think it's 
quite honestly, one of the most effective moves in jujitsu. And when I play Gi with Butterfly, if I can get that collar, man, I love that series that it's kind of a dilemma between the collar drag and uh, the ankle pick. You know, if they if they know the collar drag is coming and they posture up a lot of the time, you can come up with the ankle pick. So it, it like those are really fantastic moves from there. It's funny you mentioned that because I was thinking the exact same thing, which is that the collar drag is maybe one of the single most powerful techniques in all of jujitsu. Jitsu. It, mm. I think people don't use it as much as they should because it just doesn't look like a really, really technical move, but it's super powerful and it's a great way to get Kazushu. You can do it from standing. You can do it from butterfly guard. And if it's there, you should definitely do it. I prefer the type of collar drag where you do it with a cross collar grip. And that is an awesome way to get your opponent to fall forward. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't get a sweep out of it, you can get up to your feet. Or if that doesn't happen while your opponent is basing out, they might leave a lever exposed that you can then start attacking. Yeah, or their back. A lot of guys, when they get collar dragged or arm dragged, they tend to post out because they don't want to concede the two points. But then that leaves them in the turtle position. So a lot of the time their back is right there and you can dive on. And sometimes you can even catch chokes in the transition. That's also a real slick thing you can you can do. So it's like that that collar drag, especially the cross collar that I mean, that's where you get the real rotation from is that cross collar grip. That is such a, a powerful move. And I mean, if I'm going against a big guy where like like let's say I have a match against a big guy, I don't, I don't really fight a lot of big guys anymore because I'm <laughs> I think my fucking body can't handle absolute divisions anymore. And especially in jujitsu, it's like doing absolute matches for no money. It doesn't really fucking make any sense. But if I have to go against someone who's, you know, 50 pounds, 80 pounds, 100 pounds bigger than me, it's not really a great strategy to like, oh, I'm going to play De La Hiva or, oh, I'm going to I'm going to play like a spider guard. It's like these opponents would be so much bigger than me that I don't really want them on top of me at all. And I don't really want them to, to get an opportunity to grab my legs and to pull my knees away from my body or to stack me or put me in any of these positions where it's like. <laughs> You know, it's basically a guaranteed pass against someone good and big. But a a move like a collar drag is so effective because usually it's done right off the grip. So it's sudden. It's it's quick. It's a quick move. And uh, it's a redirecting move. It's you're you're essentially going around them rather than uh, loading them on top of you. So I think it's a much smarter strategy and it doesn't really cost you anything. There's not really a lot of risk associated with the collar drag. But again, there's that old Danaher quote again, where he's like, uh, the, you know, the longer you have grips, they don't improve with age. It's better to to get a, get once you get your grip, create a bit of Kazushi and just go right away rather than waiting, because uh, they're going to know, you know, if you're grabbing that collar, anyone who's good is going to start addressing that collar and just immediately try and break the grip. Yeah, butterfly guard as well as collar drags are low commitment techniques, which is one of the reasons why they're awesome. If things go sideways, there's very low downside to you. So you might as well try it. And with collar drags, the reason, among others, why I like the cross collar drag versus the same side collar drag is because when you have a cross collar grip, not only do you have all of that leverage, but your forearm also acts as a frame against your opponent's neck which makes it really effective if you want to do things like distance management. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, once you once you get into that collar drag, it, it is a frame. But one thing you can do, actually, you know how when you're grabbing the collar and the collar drag and you drag, if you take your, your dragging hand and you rotate your hand like you're turning a key, your arm becomes much more aligned than if you have your thumb pointing up. So again, just envision like you get the cross collar grip and your thumb is pointing up, kind of like you're holding a mug of coffee. If you drag that person and they start pushing into you, if your thumb still points up, then there's a really good chance that, I don't want to say that there's a good chance you're going to collapse your arm or your wrist, but they'll just, they'll, the frame won't be as strong. Whereas if you rotate your thumb in a downward motion, almost like you're turning a key in the door, your arm straightens and your wrist becomes more aligned. So that I use that all the time, especially if I have like a, like a collar, a cross collar, and I'm coming up on a single, that's a really good way to manage distance with your arm is turning your wrist so that your thumb points down. And then you get like uh, your, you know, your arm becomes more aligned uh, with its bones. 
That's a really good point. Are you saying that you turn your thumb so that your thumb is closer to you or you turn your thumb so that it is further away from you? So if I'm, let's say I, I, I usually collar drag with my right hand, right? So I'm in the open guard. I get a collar grip with my right hand as I drag or, or in another scenario, if I, if I do this drag and then I, you know, I pull them by me and I'm coming up on a single with the collar still, what I'll do is I'll turn my thumb down in a counterclockwise motion. So as I rotate my thumb down, my arm becomes straight. So now if they push into me, they're basically running into my fist in their face uh, and I'm framing off the collar. What that allows me to do is drive their weight onto their far leg, making the single leg really light. So I use I use that a lot when I do collar drags into singles. Uh, of course, there are some sweeps from the ankle sleeve grip where you can come up on singles with that grip as well. And it's just a, it, I think it just makes for a more, um, you know, it gives the frame more integrity. That's a really cool point and something I actually hadn't thought of before, that twist of the wrist. And I presume that one of the other benefits to doing that as well is, is going to take slack out of your opponent's gi, which is going to make the collar drag tighter as well. Yeah, it does. It does do that. I know someone who's gone to a Mikey Musumeki seminar and he said that was one thing that Mikey was showing a lot of was like, you know, when, when you're playing open guard with grips, like his guard is so fantastic. He, when you when you play an open guard with grips and you're grabbing the collar and the sleeves and stuff, he was showing a lot of details where you're like turning your wrist and just the smallest adjustment makes grips stronger, makes makes frames as we're discussing and things like that. So there is like. There's tons of little hacks there where you can put your body into better alignment and and be more efficient all over the place that we we like I think most people don't even really think about or at least most most recreational practitioners probably have no idea but it is it's it, that's one of those things when you're using like a proxy based control like controlling the gi you know there it, it reacts differently than direct lever control so it makes sense that as you twist the the linen the fabric that it it sort of bunches up or it tightens and and creates more torque it creates it just becomes tighter yeah. And another point too, something that is really important to understand is by turning your wrist like that, you're no longer requiring just your fingers to hold the grip, which is important because if your fingers are the things that are making your grips work, you're going to hurt your fingers. So if you turn your wrist like that, then it's your hand that is holding the grip and not just your fingers. That's similar to how I do the Ezekiel choke. People often ask me how I'm able to do it without busting my fingers mm -hmm. and I don't use my fingers. I use my whole fist. That's a really important thing to understand. And that's a really good pointer. If you want to make your collar drag more powerful. I remember you showing me that detail. Um, I still, when I, I, I don't usually use the traditional Ezekiel. I prefer the reverse Ezekiel, which is essentially like a, a it's like a head and arm type choke. It does use the fingers instead of the fist, but it's um, the way it is. It, it doesn't rely on, torquing on the fingers and i think that's kind of the best way to do ezekiel's where you know if you're if you're doing ezekiel's and you're burning your fingers out or you're damaging your fingers then i wouldn't invest too much in those techniques i would either find a better way to do it or not do it at all grabbing the collar turning the grip and making it more on your on your wrist and on your arm rather than on your fingers is is a huge detail another thing i actually saw gianni grippo do because he's a big open guard player you know he plays a lot of collar ankle plays a lot of collar sleeve so one thing he did i saw in a video maybe a year and a half ago was when he grabs the collar he grabs and he puts his fingers not just on the lapel but he slips them into the armpit so you're grabbing like essentially you're grabbing like the shoulder uh, material and you filling your hand with more gi and because your fingers are kind of dipping into the armpit it really creates a nice grip and uh don't know i don't know how effective that would be for a collar drag per se but like when you're playing collar sleeve or collar uh, ankle if you get a deeper grip it can really it can make the grip a lot stronger because you're not like it's not really like you're using your fingers, uh, your fingertips to hold the lapel, but you're kind of hooking your whole hand inside the armpit. Kind of cheap, but it does work real nice. 
I wouldn't say it's cheap. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And one of the things about Butterfly Guard is you're going to have a lot of opportunities to set up good grips like that. It's great because you've got both of your hands available to fight and you're using your legs to check your opponent's movement. So if you're playing Butterfly Guard in the Gi, there's a very good chance that you're going to wind up with a powerful grip out of it. So all of these little details are going to help you a ton. The other thing about Butterfly Guard is your opponent can move around. It can be hard to force your opponent into that position. But once you get a good collar grip on them, like a cross collar grip, it becomes a lot easier to check their motion and keep them in front of you while you're fighting. Yeah. And if you want, you can totally transition to other guards off that cross collar grip. It, that I think that's probably the most versatile grip just because you can you know, to, to transition to and from different guards because it, it just, it connects everything. And of course, you know, having some good X guard and single leg X guard entries from there is real important. Again, it's funny. I keep, keep fucking puffing this guy off, but Gordon is like, you know, I'm watching his tapes and, and entries that I've done, I'm watching him do it. And I'm realizing like, wow, he's, he's doing something slightly different, but I can see it's going to make all the difference. You know, so it's it's good. Also, it, on a side note, when you learn jujitsu and you sort of like have your systems, you have your favorite moves that you go to a lot. You know, I I was very comfortable getting into single leg X before I watched Gordon's DVD, and I thought I had an entry that was like, okay, this is the best way to do the two on one and the single leg X. And then I watch how he does it, and I'm like, oh, that's what he's doing. And then I go and try it. I'm like, that feels so much fucking better. Like if I, it just, it's way higher percentage. It feels way safer. It feels like I'm not getting crushed from there at all. Uh, so, so back to my point, it's like, you know, you can learn your favorite moves and, and think that you're doing them the best way, but never think that you know everything because I mean, I'm going back and, and sort of breaking old habits and relearning things that I feel like I should already know. But man, because all this material is out now, I can do that. So never be that guy that's like, I already know how to do this or I already, you know, I have my favorite way of doing this or whatever. It's like, well, you might have a closed mind attitude if without even knowing it, if that's what you're doing. Right. So it's never too late to like relearn new entries into into basic situations. Yeah, that's a really awesome point. And I think it's critical because with things like open guard, which wind up being so dynamic, there are new details that are getting discovered every day. And there might be other details that, you know, maybe they're not total game changers for everyone, but for you, they're a strategy that might work a little bit better than what you're doing. So you have to keep an open mind and you have to always be looking for new things that you can expand into your game or replace things in your game if you find a more effective tool. That's so critical there. And that's actually one of the big differences between open guard and close guard. Close guard is about slowing things down and taking away movement. Whereas in open guard, you're not necessarily doing that. It is the movement and the fluidity that make these positions effective. So if you only have one tool when you're playing open guard, you're doing yourself a little bit of a disservice because you can't always guarantee you're going to wind up in the situation where you can use that one tool. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm realizing as, you know, time goes on and I get deeper into my black belt and I learn more stuff, I'm realizing now that I have these techniques and I understand how they work. It's not so much about executing the technique. It's more about executing the setup that leads to the technique. So it's not really like the, it's not really the, how do you do something? It's, it's because, you know, at this point, the technique is there. It's more when to use something like if you use a technique that is like you know maybe not the cleanest but you use it at the right time that's way more effective than doing a technique to its perfection but not at the right time you know a lot of the time you're going to get stuffed you're going to get smashed from there it's if specifically if you haven't broken your opponent's posture structure base but if you do break their alignment and from situations like the, the open guard where it's butterfly guard or seated guard whatever Usually, again, what Gordon says, either expose the center line, expose the back or or break their balance to to force them to post their hands or or even their legs on the mat, you know, and, and once you get that limb extension, you get lots of opportunities. So it's not so much uh, at the higher levels, you know, everyone's so good. Everyone already has their game. It's not 
really how you do something, but when, right? It's, it's more about the context uh, of how you execute these techniques that make them effective at the highest levels because you, you need to have the right reactions. You know, it's interesting you bring that up because that is definitely a mental model for life. I don't know what it's called. And if any of our listeners have experience or knowledge of this, please do write in because I would love to know. But that concept that timing matters so much. It's not just about doing things the right way. It's about doing the right thing at the right time. And to be even more strategic, like you mentioned earlier, creating situations where the timing is right. Those things matter so much because if you do something that is absolutely done the right way, if you're just not doing it in the right time and place, you might not get the results that you want. But if you're able to maximize timing, then you can get away with doing things less effectively, but still get better results just by virtue of being in the right place at the right time. You see this all the time in business. I was actually just talking to a guy the other day who's starting up a company. And what he was saying was the reason why he thinks this is going to be the big thing now is because of timing. It's not something he necessarily thought would have worked a few years ago, but due to the current situation and things that are happening right now, he thinks that like this is when the iron is hot. And there's a lot of great examples of that. It, technologies that maybe were released too soon. And this sounds crazy. You know, you think, how can a, how can a breakthrough technology get released too soon? But that actually happens quite often where some amazing innovation comes out, but the world just isn't ready for it yet. And then many years later, someone does something very similar and maybe they don't even do it as good as the original person did, but due to the timing, they get a lot more traction. And you'll find this a lot too. When you look at companies that really have incredible success, the things that they're doing, they might not be the first person who's ever done it, but they were the first person who ever did it and got traction behind it. And in that sense, jujitsu is very similar too, because it's not just about doing the right move. It's about doing it in the right circumstances. So adding on to, you know, doing things at the right time, I know a guy who he had, he had a stable job, very good job. It was, it was well paid, but he opened his own company and his own company was basically, he had these really expensive cameras and he basically, do you remember that video game Descent? where you're like going through the, the, the map. Oh yeah. 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 I remember that game. It's like a 3d map, right? And you can like navigate through the map and see everything in, inside. And it's kind of like that. He would go into, you know, big buildings and, and even like colleges and apartment buildings and, and expensive houses with these drones. And basically he would take pictures of every room so that when it's all packaged and done, the customer can view the entire property from their home using like a three, basically like a Google maps, but like on steroids, right? So they can see, they can see every room and see the layout of the entire house. It's actually really cool technology. And, um, you know, he launched his business and he worked at it for like a year and man, it flopped. And it was sad because he had de put so much money into it. And like you said, they just, it's like they weren't ready for the technology yet, right? And it actually, it flopped so hard that he had to stop his business and go back to his old job just to support his family or whatever. And then fucking COVID happened. And now nobody wants to go to, to properties or to houses to look at things. So all of a sudden there was a huge demand for his business. And now it's like, Right now, the like you said, the iron is hot and he's he's uh, he's got tons of work and making really good money right now. So it's like it's interesting, you know, if you if you if you keep your options open and you're aware of patterns and you can sort of see several moves happening ahead, man, you can you can strike while the iron's hot for sure. And it, it just takes a matter of identifying the proper opportunities or creating the proper opportunities and then taking, uh, you know, taking advantage of that when it comes up. And it's, it's no different from a jujitsu match, right? Like a move that you're trying to hit right now for, for the tactics you're using. It doesn't mean the move doesn't work. It just means that you're not putting it in the proper context, if you can create the proper reaction, the move will work. Now the, the question just comes from how do you create enough pressure, in this case from the bottom, to, f to facilitate that move through a reaction? 
it's funny because I think one age old problem that everyone who's ever done jujitsu can relate to is the situation where everyone goes to class and you learn a technique of the day and then you're asked to train and then everyone tries that technique and no one can make it work. And the reason why is the context. You have a room full of people who just spent a class training this technique. So they know you're going to try it and they're ready to defend it. Oh, absolutely. So that's one of the paradoxes of training that the worst time to practice the technique is right after you learned it because all of your training partners are ready for it. So it's not that the technique doesn't work. It's that you're trying to make it effective in the worst possible time. So that's actually a training dilemma that I don't know the solution to, but it's something that I'm sure everyone can relate to. And is very similar with the rest of life where timing is just so critical. And sometimes trying to force a result when the timing is wrong is just not what you want to do because you're not going to get any forward traction. Yeah, I think the, the solution for that in training i know i know just what you're talking about so like i could give you a few uh some standing examples and i could give you some some ground examples so like if we're on the ground and we're, we're drilling guard passing right like a a standard way that people would drill guard passing maybe 10 years ago would be like okay do 100 leg drags on each side you know so like do them as fast as you can do them as clean as you can and your partner on the bottom is basically doing nothing right like yes you're getting your repetitions but you are in no way creating reactions and that's really what you need so just just drilling these reps like speed reps over and over it's like yes it has its place but i believe that that non-resistant repetition and training when when it comes to techniques i think that should only be reserved for when you when a technique is brand new to you do you know what i mean like if you do these leg drag passes over and over again i look at it more of a as a more of a warm up you're not really like learning the system of the leg drag like if my opponent high legs i'm going into this if they shrimp out i'm going into this you know it's it's more just like okay we're getting warm and we're just doing the movements we're not actually learning how to use it and if I was going to use it in, you know, a live sense, I would use fuck your jujitsu. So it's like, OK, I'm going to do my passing and that involves leg drags, whatever, uh, you know, side smash, knee cuts, all this. And I'm going to try and link it together. My partner on the bottom is only allowed to frame like they're not allowed to sweep me. OK, and then that's how we can really target the passing so that I can see what my opponent's natural guard retention reactions will be. Yet I basically win almost every time because the, the game is stacked so that I win, right? That is like one of the, the great parts about fuck your jujitsu is it gives you that live resistance, but it's in a very controlled, safe manner and you can really hone something in. Another example, you know, if, if I'm going to mention this in a standing situation, I can remember when I first started doing judo, maybe like eight years ago and uh, God, I was fucking so bad. Like I had no idea. I had no idea what I was doing. Like forward break falls were like challenging for me. And I, and I was a purple belt at the time I started. And then we're going and doing forward Ukemi down the mat. And I'm like, holy fuck. Like I can't even do a forward roll properly. I can't make it look good. Uh, and then it came time to do Uchikomi. So we're going in and we're doing repetitions on how to do Sayanagi, right? We're doing it on a non-resisting opponent, doing our entries. And then like on the fifth one, we'd throw. I can remember for years... Even on a non-resisting opponent, I had issues doing these throws. I just couldn't do it. And then once I was able to do the throws, I would try and do them in Randori, and I couldn't fucking do it because I'm used to drilling it on someone who is standing there giving me Kazushi, not reacting. And so I realized I have to now go through another level of of training and programming where I, I literally have to program the proper reactions and the movements and sort of feel the ebb and flow of the randori to be able to actually do the move. So I've come to the conclusion that when it comes time to teach moves uh, and it comes time to drill, I think if, if, if it's a fundamentals class or if it's a warm up or if it's a brand new technique, it's it's fine to drill on a non-resisting opponent. But if you want to actually like really figure out where can you get your Sayanagis from, you know, where can you, where can, when, when is the proper time to go for that Sayanagi or when is the proper time to hit that fireman's carry? You have to drill with live movement. You have to, you know, and it doesn't have to be full on live Randori where it's like 100% each side. 
but moving uchikomi where you start to incorporate some patterns and, and footwork that is so much more valuable than like just standing in one spot and doing uchikomi and over and over again i think a lot of high level judoka that do that type of stuff they're doing it basically to get warm you know they're not and 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 for speed they're not really doing it to like learn when to use that move yeah, absolutely. That is something that I think everyone who's done any martial art can relate to, which is that, you know, moves done as a drill don't necessarily translate to moves done in reality. I agree with you that there's a time and a place for each of these things when you are seeing something for the first time and it is so alien to you that you can't even execute the steps or that you have to stop and think just to execute the steps. That is when drilling without resistance is helpful. But as soon as you get to the point where you're comfortable enough with the movements that you can do them and you don't need to stop and think and try to recall what it is that you need to do, then you need to start dialing up the resistance because it is the reaction of a resisting opponent that makes or breaks a move. And learning to identify those predictable responses and work around them and be ready for them and adding that dynamic layer of your game where you can try these things, see the predictable response and know what to do while your opponent is one step behind that's what high level martial arts is all about sorry i just had to just had to grab my fucking cat again piece of shit it's great how much you love those cats dude they're like climbing on my computer and munching kibble in the background like fuck off dude go sleep somewhere but i still love them there's still do you notice how cats get so disgusting once you have kids you're like you're just you're just a nuisance now. You know what? We were just talking <laughs> about this today. It is weird how you get used to the smell of cat urine and cat shit. Like it is vile. I mean, oh God, it's so bad. Yeah. And I guess I just gotten used to it. But now that I've got a kid, like I thought that, you know, changing a kid's diaper would be the grossest thing. It's actually not so bad at all. And so our daughter, you know, sometimes she'll have an accident. She'll like pee on the couch. You can clean that up super easy without too much of an issue. It doesn't like just totally destroy the furniture, but cat piss is the worst. I don't know what it is, but it's just vile. Yeah, it doesn't go away. Why is that? Like, like if one of your kids pisses, it's like, I mean, it sucks, but it, it doesn't have that like crazy pungent odor, but a cat pisses in it. What does it smell like? Like iodine? Is that what it is? It's just like an intense chemical smell. Yeah, I don't know. I should ask my wife. She's a biologist, so she'd know. But it, yeah, there's something about cats like their piss and their shit is just awful. And we've got this one cat who's just like a behemoth he's like i don't know if he's over 20 pounds but he's getting there and like he takes the most epic shits they're like man-sized <laughs> shits and when he takes a crap like the whole house reeks and it is just the most vile thing i want to see him fight clay my, <laughs> my boy cat i think your cat's probably got like three or four pounds on clay but he's lazy He's got more fur. Yeah, Clay, I think, is probably a bit more athletic, but Clay is also, like, stupidly clunky. He's basically, like, a really jacked white belt. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, cats naturally are at least purple belts just by nature, so I would totally love to see them grapple, except... I think Clay would die probably. <laughs> I don't know. You don't know how lazy this cat is of mine. Like he won't do anything. He's a total pacifist. Anyway. But when when we're talking about uh, drilling, you know, I, I, I stick with Keenan where he says, you know, whether it's target sparring or just live training should basically be about 60, at least 60 percent of your training, you know, and the other and the other 40 percent should be dedicated to, you know, you could do a little bit of of non-resistant drilling. I think it's I think the best application for that is, like you said, whether you're learning a brand new move or if you're just creaky at the beginning of class and you just need to get like a bit of a sweat going, I think that's a great way to warm up. But in terms of learning it's not really the greatest, you know, you really got to feel the, the, the reactions because that's by, by learning the reactions based on your techniques, that's how you, that's how you create systems, right? That's how you're going to know, like, you know, what are the main, what are the main responses that my opponent's going to give me? And then what are the, what are the answers I'm going to have for those problems? So if, when it, when it comes time to building systems and actually learning the application of techniques, you definitely have to have that live stuff. And that's why I think 
fuck your jujitsu so valuable is because it's so safe. Um, it's such a safe way to train and it's so targeted that it's, uh, it's so specific in nature that you really get the most out of your time from what I can see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A fantastic chat. Anything else you want to add before we tie this up? I do not. Maybe we do our plugs, shameless plugs. Yeah, let's go through the motions. So let's talk about the mental models here that we talked about today. First and foremost, inside channel control. Butterfly guard is all about inside channel control. It is the guard when it comes to that mental model. Basically, the idea with butterfly guard is you want to have your legs on the inside, your hands on the inside, your head on the inside. Inside channel control is what makes butterfly guard powerful. We talked about body tethering. One of the things about butterfly guard is that you are not tethered to your opponent, which means that their movement does not necessarily force movement on your side. We talked about types of guard. Butterfly guard is a hook based guard, meaning you're not necessarily clamping or locking onto your opponent. You're not necessarily using frames to keep them at bay. What you're doing is you're using hooks to track them and to follow them. We talked about Kazushi. With Butterfly Guard, one of the challenges is it's hard to just execute a technique from there. You need to get Kazushi. So some great ways to do that are arm drags or trying to frame away off of your opponent's head. We talked about head position. With Butterfly Guard, if you're encountering a situation where your opponent is being very stubborn and they're down on both knees, getting height advantage and raising your head above them can be a very powerful strategy because it allows you to bum rush the guy and knock them over, which is a sweep. And that's one of the weird things about Butterfly Guard, which is that most of the time when you're playing it, you want your head below your opponent's head. But when you go for that strategy where you go for height advantage, you want to get up on your feet and then you want your head above their head. We talked about single versus double lever control. So one of the great ways to get Kazushi from Butterfly Guard is to go for things like arm drags, which is a great example of using a single lever. We talked about principles over techniques. Now, with Butterfly Guard, the reality is a lot of the times the techniques you attack are not going to be super pretty from there. It's generally just sticking to solid principles and trying to create openings from Butterfly Guard that is the most winning strategy. We talked about limb coiling. So when you're playing butterfly guard, you're keeping all of your limbs in tight. And that's great because it makes it very hard for your opponent to actually control you. So even though butterfly guard might actually feel like you're not really in a very good defensive position, it turns out you are because it's very hard for your opponent to pull one of your levers free. We talked about committed techniques. Butterfly guard and collar drags are both very effective techniques because they're not particularly committed. So if something goes sideways, then the odds of something bad happening from that are pretty slim. We talked about direct versus proxy control. So direct control being when you are connected to someone's body directly, proxy control being when you're connected to something else that's connected to them. So generally that's going to be the gi. So collar drags, for example, are a great example of proxy control. We talked about beginner's mind, the idea that you always want to have your mind open and receptive to new ideas, regardless of how much expertise you have. We talked about incremental learning, meaning that you can't learn everything all in one go. So when you're the instructor, you need to provide lessons in layers. There's going to be a time when your students need basic drills, but then there's going to be a time once they're comfortable with that, when you need to start adding in resistance. And we talked about predictable responses. A very high level understanding of any strategy requires you to know the predictable responses. And that's what allows you to get ahead of your opponent and act while they're still reacting to the last thing that you attempted. Very nice. So with that said, Matt, got a question for you. Shoot. Yeah. This is basically a self-serving layup question, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Hey guys, first off, loving the podcast. I'm catching up on all past episodes as we speak. I'm a white belt and learning a ton from you and guys like Rob Bernacki. Please keep up the great work. I'm also subscribed to your newsletter and I love the updates you send there too. Unfortunately, I missed out on your earlier ones. Is there any chance you can publish your newsletter content as a blog on your website and perhaps longer form commentary too? You have a backlog of content now that you can release every week and the regular updates are sure to get noticed by the 
the Google algorithm, which should drive more organic traffic to your site. Lastly, I tried to get the crash course, but it didn't work, possibly because I'm already on the mailing list. Have you thought about publishing the BJJ Mental Models database as a reference paperback and selling it on your store or on Amazon? I'd be happy to buy it to support the podcast. You could also put together a longer form book with extended commentary, but that would take a bit more effort. Have a great day. Well, my friend, (laughs) your timing is very, very good. Actually, this email came in a long time ago, but I've kind of been sitting on it and waiting for the right opportunity to talk about it. So we've got a few initiatives on the go if you're into the long form written content. I think everyone knows about this because we plug it on the podcast, but we've got a newsletter. Um, Actually, interestingly, the newsletter is growing like crazy. Like I think it's growing faster than the actual podcast at this point. So we'll plug that at the end of the show. But on our newsletter every week, on Friday, we send out kind of like a detailed long form article, usually an expansion on what we talked about on the podcast that week. Now, the way that we set it up, it's not a blog, it's a newsletter and you get that content when you get the email. And if you want to get like old newsletters, we don't have a place you can go to get those, Um, or at least we didn't. And that was intentional because we wanted to incentivize people to build a relationship with us, to get on our list so that they could reply to these newsletters letters. We could have a back and forth conversation about their questions. And that happens a lot where we'll send out the weekly newsletter and people will just reply and ask questions. And it creates a great dialogue and bridge with our audiences. And we don't really get that just by having a blog. So we actually intentionally decided not to just push this stuff up there because I want to have a more direct relationship with the people who listen. Now, that said, one of the things that I did start doing recently for the people on Patreon is I've been publishing the newsletter articles there as well for their convenience. So that's where you can go if you want to actually get a database of the old articles. I publish them on Patreon and they're less transient there. You can go and find old articles there, no problem. So if you want to get access to those, Patreon is the place to go for us. And on the topic of that, on the topic of the book, after dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people asking us to do the book, we have done the book. (laughs) And let me tell you, it was quite an ordeal. So a lot of the mental models that we originally wrote came from a long time ago, back when we started this whole project and probably needed to be touched up a lot. So Matt has spent a ton of time updating all of that content on the website, of which there is a lot. I now have that in a rough draft book format. I'm going to put that out to the patrons in the gold tier on our Patreon, and it's going to be available hopefully soon in PDF and in EPUB format. So on that note, that's a good transition to the plugs. Uh, The big way that you can support this show, patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. Again, if you want to support us on Patreon, that's the best thing you can do to support us and you get access to all of that awesome content. Again, that's patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. If you want to learn more about the concepts that we talk about on the show, you can go to bjjmentalmodels.com. That's also where we have a contact form where you can get in touch with us. You can go to bjjmentalmodels.com com slash store to pick up our merch. That's where we've got gi patches, t-shirts, and hoodies. You can go to bjjmentalmodels.com slash join to get on the mailing list we talked about earlier. And you can check us out on Facebook and on Instagram. Awesome, Matt. Well, I think that was a great chat. This is the third of five episodes on the Open Guard series. So thank you so much, everyone, for your attention. And we'll talk to you next time. Thanks, guys. Great chat. 